I ask our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this tremendous opportunity to gather together as family in the unity of the faith, Father. Thank you for faith that you've given us. Thank you for the inspired word of God that you've given us. Thank you for giving us of your spirit so that we might fellowship with you this way, in this unique way, and breaking bread together, the very bread of life, Father, the word of God. Father, thank you for your patience, your mercy, your grace, your love, for delivering us each and every day, for saving us each and every day. You do all this to your glory, Father. Thank you. We pray for those that are ill in our congregation that would desire to be here with us this morning, that maybe even are with us this morning, that you heal them in your good time. We pray for those that are still lost in this world, Father, that they come to know your Son and you through your Son so we might have additional brothers and sisters with us for all of eternity in heaven. What a precious time that will be. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your Son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make a morning like this a fellowship, a reality for us. We do just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, what is repentance and who gets to define it? This is part 10. We began class on Thursday with a little parable that I made up about a man and his two sons and a solid picket fence that only the dad could see over, and a parade that was passing by on the other side. One son gladly took up his father's offer to hold him up in his arm to see over the fence, while the other refused his father's help, even tried to stack some backyard items on top of each other to climb up on. But his attempts failed and he crashed missing the parade altogether. While it upset the father and even the, the younger son, he let his son choose for himself. Sound familiar? Go to Matthew 7.24. Matthew 7.24. It's one of the things that I appreciate the most about our Father in Heaven is that while... Certain realities obviously are crushing to his own heart. Uh, he lets us choose. And because of that, he is righteous in all his judgments. Matthew seven twenty four. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And it just remind me of that little boy who crashed down, who caught a glimpse of the parade, maybe even a little of the brass, heard it but missed it for all intents and purposes, and great was his fall up here on the board. No structure ever erected by mankind will ever stand the test of time. Only God's gracious plan is able to save man. The plans of the so-called rich and the wise will all crumble. Again, great was its fall. No structure ever erected by mankind will ever stand the test of time. Only God's gracious plan is able to save man. The plans of the so-called rich and the wise will all crumble. 1 Corinthians 1.25 up here reads, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
Again, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. So the fallen house in this parable of Jesus represents the life of the unbeliever whose sentence to the lake of fire will be their terminal, everlasting reality. How great is that fall? When you erect a, quote, good life in the eyes of others, those that are still completely attached to this world, and you build this life, this so-called successful life, and you end up in the lake of fire. How great is that fall? You're at the pinnacle of so-called life, and the next moment you're in hell. How great of a fall is that? As most of you know, Jesus spoke about hell about seven times more often than he did heaven. Why? Go to Luke 13.3. I'll tell you why. Because he loved. That's why. That's why if we love others, we ought to have no problem, no problem talking about hell and talking about the sovereign God and his ability to sentence those unrepentant people to hell. Why did he talk about hell so much more often than heaven? Luke 13, 3, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's why. He cared. He loved. He was of his father, of course, who wants to save all and to have those same individuals come to the knowledge of him. And so we know off God's motivation in all of this, and therefore we know our Lord's motivation in all of this. And therefore, as our ultimate shepherd, our great shepherd, our great teacher on the gospel itself, we too should not be remiss in presenting the gospel with full force of the sovereignty of God. Because like Jesus said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you see? That's part of the gate. He doesn't, he doesn't even get to faith, so-called faith yet, the other side of the coin. He says, unless you repent, you will perish. Which says, stop right here. Does it not? Stop right here. Unless you repent, you can't go any further. End of story. All right, so we need to press on on this question that we've been contemplating now for ten parts. What is repentance and who gets to define it? One of the inescapable realities about this series on repentance is that it is literally impossible to talk about repentance in the absence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. One of the inescapable realities about this series on repentance is that it is literally impossible to talk about repentance in the absence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I don't want to teach this thing as a standalone doctrine, let's say, because I believe you can make mistakes. I've made them myself. I want to teach it from the centerpiece of our faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want it to be an artifact. I want it to be intrinsically bound to any and all discussions we have about the gospel and vice versa. We talk about repentance, we have to talk about the gospel. We talk about the gospel, we have to talk about repentance. I want them to be together like that. And I don't want to make that awful mistake that some even well-intentioned theologians and pastors make. They separate things out so far and so and there's such minutia involved that you lose sight of the big picture. And it's a lot easier to detach things now. Right? You, you know what I'm saying? You get so far away from the big picture, all of a sudden it's a lot easier to detach something from what we would call reality. And I don't want that to happen and so you don't want that to happen when you're out there evangelizing either. 
So it's impossible to talk about repentance in the absence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I gave you some quotes last week from uh, Spurgeon and some other guys. Um, and I wanted to give you a couple few more here from Charles Spurgeon on the topic of repentance. They're just so well stated that I want to share them with you. Spurgeon on repentance a sinner can no more repent and believe without the Holy Spirit's aid than he can create a world. <laughs> a sinner can no more repent and believe without the Holy Spirit's aid than he can create a world. Look, we're born dead, deaf as a doornail, regarding the gospel call even. And so we have God the Holy Spirit's help. He as we would say theologically, quickens us to repentance, to faith, to believing, to salvation. We have no choice. How are we going to climb out of that pit without His help? He also said this, another proof of the conquest of a soul for Christ will be found in a real change of life. If the man does not live differently, from what he did before, both at home and abroad, his repentance need to be repented of, and his conversion is a fiction. That's not a popular statement, but that was literally the holy subject, uh, uh, holy uh, accepted, orthodox viewpoint of repentance, because that's what's in the Bible. That's what's in the Bible. Otherwise, you're supposing or presuming that God is impotent. That when God says, I will create you a new creature and give you a new heart, that nothing changes. So which one are you going to go with? I'm going to lean on the side of saying God's not impotent. That He's all-powerful. That He says, if I'm going to change you, He really does change you. Because that's what the Bible says he does. And it's literally, I hate to use the word common sense, but I hope you get it. There is a certain common sense in the Bible. Like you read the Bible and it's common sense. It just makes sense until you stop making things more complicated. Then it, does, it stops making sense and you venture in the, into the realm of intellectualism, which is what I was talking about before. You start getting so granular it's easier to detach things, hold doctrines that become perversions in of themselves. So there's a sort of a, I don't know, logical way of looking at the Bible, and it just makes sense. Again, another proof of the conquest of a soul for Christ will be found in a real change of life. If the man does not live differently from what he did before, both at home and abroad, his repentance needs to be repented of, and his conversion is a fiction. And then this next quote from him um, that really makes you think. So just sort of listen to the entire thing before you say, wait a minute, what's he talking about up here in the board? He says, learn this lesson, not to trust Christ because you repent, but trust Christ to make you repent. Not to come to Christ because you have a broken heart, but to come to Him that He may give you a broken heart. And to continue, not to come to Him because you are fit to come, but to come to Him because you are unfit to come. <laughs> Do you see the difference and I hope you know that, that I would never teach anything other than your unfitness to come to Jesus Christ. God forbid I teach salvation by works. Never. May it never be. Your fitness is your unfitness. <laughs> right? It would be like going to the gym and saying, look at me. I don't need you, Mr. Trainer. I'm, I'm better shape than you are. And you know, you're like way out of shape or something. 
let's say. What's, he, what's that person going to work with? They're going to say, then what are you here for? Well, I just want to get my ticket to heaven. Because look at me. I'm already fit enough to go to heaven. I just need my ticket from you, I guess. Because you're the gatekeeper. So give me my ticket. What must I do to gain eternal life? That's the rich young ruler. Your fitness is your unfitness. Your qualification is your lack of qualification. Fantastic. What a preacher Mr. Spurgeon was. Truly a gift to the church. Now, as the Spirit's been laying out for us some, somewhat theologically, has been the following key pair of principles up here on the board. On the topic of divine justice... Since we are commanded to repent, believe, and have faith, it is righteous to say that we are handed personal accountability to God on this topic of our own salvation. The Bible is very clear on this, that if you don't repent, believe, and have faith, you will be sentenced to the lake of fire, which is why some people go and some people don't. We call that free will. Or some call it volition. I don't care what you call it. Just know that you are personally accountable when it comes to your own salvation. However, we also know this, that we have also learned that it is by God's grace alone that we are even able to repent, believe, have saving faith, etc. In fact, God saves those He's chosen no more, no less. So on one hand, you're accountable. On the other hand, it's by God's grace alone that you're saved. What happens between those two, that big chasm that's in your head right now, is God's business. That's why I'm not ever going to say, you're saved and you're not. Or you're saved and you're not. That is not my business. My business is to teach the truth and the Word of God. If these two things are too far apart for you and you're having a problem reconciling them, you lack faith. That's it. You've got to hand it over, just like Spurgeon said. You're unfit to do this thing. That's God's business. How He takes... It's, it's unbelievable. How He is willing, even, to take a person in the throes of spiritual death and make them alive in Christ is beyond me. Far beyond me as a mere teacher. I don't want to do that business, do you see? I don't want to be that judge, because I'm not. That's the great mistake that I've seen with even well-intentioned pastors and theologians. They say, no, you know what? You can be a wimpy man. Me? I'm going to take a shot at this. I'm going to take a shot at this middle part right here. I'll even create systems of theology Let's call it systematic theology. I'll write volumes on it to satisfy your lust to understand the things of God that God hasn't disclosed to you. Because that's exactly what it is. It's a lust for you to control things that God says that's not your business. That's how cults start. That's how religions start. Think of the Pharisees. That's what they did. I give you this, you added all this to it, and you put people in bondage as a result. Think of contemporary Christianity. Some of you are just part of another religion. God says, I give you this, and you added all this to it, and you put a bunch of people in bondage to false doctrines. It wasn't your business. So some of you are backing out of what you thought was a deep understanding of Holy Scripture, but it was a lie. And God's saying, no, 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 you need to back out. All those little doctrines you thought you owned with the long words and the, the hyphens and the multisyllabic ex explanations, garbage. Garbage from men trying to elevate themselves and prove themselves what? Superior? Gnostic? And your little lust loved it. And that's why you didn't question it. 
Sneaky. Satan's smart, isn't he? Oh, he is so smart. He is so smart. For most of us, it's, it's very simple. You ready? You're awesome. You know, I didn't think so yesterday. But now that you mention it, I think I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> He's really smart, and you're blind. Right? It's so stupid. Another perfect example, sorry, young men. Push on, he's got the flu. Pray for him. A young man, I tell him this all the time, like, all it's going to take is some beautiful young girl to go, you're awesome. And all of a sudden you're completely blind. Oh, oh. <laughs> right? Why do, why do men get completely, like, they turn into, like, buffoons? Right? All, all bets are off. All of a sudden, all their integrity has gone. Everything's gone. Everything's out the window. <laughs> Lust. Satan's really smart. Anyways. As Spurgeon alluded to earlier, we must carry a certain quality within us that God sees, namely an unfitness that makes us fit for salvation and or deliverance. Even we can learn from this because the patterns are always the same. I hope you realize that. The pattern at salvation proper is the same pattern at salvation after you're saved. It's always by grace. And it's always a, a realization that you're basically unfit without God's help. You, as a believer right now, there's no, you can't walk one more... Just remember this. You cannot walk one more step without the help of God the Holy Spirit in your life. Not one more step. Not in any good direction. The only way you're able to do anything, and this is what Paul said, by the grace of God I am what I am. The only way you're even to take one more step is by God's grace through His Holy Spirit who empowers us. That's the only way. It was the same thing that happened at salvation proper. You have to realize, though, that you're unfit to do it on your own. No matter how good you look at the gym. No, how, no matter how spiritually fit you think you are, flexing in the mirror. Oh, look at this. Look at these big words. Look at these big doctrines. Look at the gun show. Right? What's all that? Ridiculousness. It's ridiculousness. That's not godly. Did Jesus act like that? No. Not at all. He was literally the exact opposite. He spoke very simply, and he ate with prostitutes and tax collectors. The supposed slobs of society. I don't know. We mustn't ever forget basic tenets in Holy Scripture, such as this one, Romans 5, 6, but while we are still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's right. When you were completely unfit. He made you fit in God's eyes by giving you and affording you His own righteousness. Here's what we've been learning. God's grace is all sufficient. Certainly enough to quicken a totally depraved person to repentant faith. We noted a popular passage worth revisiting that essentially walks us through the words of our Lord and Savior on the following topics up here on the board. And I apologize about the small font, but it was just a really a pregnant passage. So much going on. We'll read it again quickly as a review. In Luke 18, from 9 to 14, we have an issue of conversion, repentance and justification by faith in view through the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember, this is, these are Jesus' words. And remember, at any point in time, you can get these, these are all outlined for you on the website. Luke 18, 15 to 17 was regarding simplicity and the faith of a child, and that was entrance into the kingdom. 18 to 25, rejection, refusal of denying self. That's the parable of the rich young ruler. And see this series, the consecutive nature of what Jesus was saying? He was talking about salvation. This is what is required. This is what it looks like. 
verses 26, 27, grace proper, God saves, and then 28 to 30, salvation proper, eternal life in the kingdom. So let's walk this passage together again. Go to Luke 18, 9. Again, I'll go quicker than I did on Thursday, since this is review. Luke 18, 9. And think of big picture. There's a reason why he's giving us this entire passage of Scripture because he wants you to see how Jesus would approach the concept of salvation. He would use parable and sometimes he'd make plain statements. But see how it is uh, all one topic, if you would. Because remember, his whole ministry was to seek and to save. And so he really primarily was always talking about salvation. Luke 18, 9. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt up here on the board who trusted in themselves. This is a picture of an arrogant unbeliever to be contrasted with a believer who is saved through humility. Look at verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. That's the guy with all the muscles in the gym, this, the one who thinks he's spiritually fit. I fast twice a week. See, I go to the gym all the time. See, you see it? I pay tithes of all that I get. I put in the time. You see, that's why I have this bod. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, not even in the so-called gym, I guess, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. In other words, what did he recognize? His unfitness, his disqualification by himself. I tell you, this man, this is Jesus, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. That's the house built on sand. And how great is its fall. Again, that was, to the point on the board, that was the idea of conversion. Let's continue with simplicity, the faith of a child. Verse 15, And they were bringing even their babies to him so that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they began rebuking them. But Jesus called for them, saying, Permit the children to come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter at all. In other words, there is a simplicity to all of this. It's not complicated. He just wants uh, a trusting heart, an individual who is like a child, who is willing to give up um, and surrender any idea of self-righteousness or saving self. Just like, that's why I told you that parable. I can't look over the fence on my own. I'll never get up there. Father, can you, I'll pick you up, says the father. Okay, let me pick you up. That's the simplicity. That's the faith of a child. Verse 18, we get into the rejection, refusal to deny self. A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He already knew that this person was an unbeliever. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and the mother. So this person was obviously aware of, knowledgeable of even, Holy Scripture. But he wasn't saved. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. Look at me, I'm fit too. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. You see, he wasn't following him yet. He really wasn't interested in following him yet. He just wanted his ticket. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. 
So there we have an individual, obviously, rejecting the gospel. Refu I mean, he's talking to the person who literally is the owner of the gospel, the author and perfecter of our faith, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. And he sa basically says no. <laughs> and ends up walking away sad. Verse 26 and 27, simply grace. Look at verse 26. They who heard it said, then who can be saved? I mean, when you hear something that magnanimous, right? From the Lord himself. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Come on, that sounds pretty hard to me. But you know what's funny? If we had a needle on stage right now and a fully grown camel, I won't do that. I'll probably make a mess. And God... If God wanted that camel to go through that eye in your presence, he would do it. And you'd be like, how did that just happen? What it would look like, I have no idea. But if he wanted it to happen, since God, with God all things are possible, he could make it happen. might be painful for the camel. But he would make it happen. Do you believe that? No, see, that's what I'm saying. I think a lot of people, so-called Christians, don't have that kind of faith. And then it makes me question. It's like, if you don't have that kind of faith, it makes me wonder about, honest to God, I hate to be a downer, your salvation. Because from my eyes, it's a lot harder to save your behind than it is to get a camel through the eye of a needle. Salvation is a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. So if you, if you don't believe in, if you don't have that kind of faith that God can do something like that, what kind of faith do you have in Him saving you? It's the weirdest thing, right? They say, oh, God could never do that, or, you know, God can't do this, or God can't. Do you believe that he actually created the universe? Just by saying he wanted the universe to exist, and he actually created it? Do you believe it? Oh, yeah. Then what are you struggling about? He can do that, but he can't do this? He can save you, but he can't do this other thing because it doesn't make logical sense? Either you have faith or you don't. Who can be saved then? Right? I mean, that would be a normal response, given the crowd. But he said, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. That's what faith looks like. And then finally, verses 28 through 30, on the topic of salvation and eternal life in the kingdom, Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you, because that's what sheep do. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. So, in other words, there's, my promises aren't vapid. My promises aren't void of reality. If my Father saves you through me, then you're going to be saved. You're going to be Literally plucked from here and placed here. Well, who, how's that happen? With God, all things are possible. But I want to know. You tell me exactly how he does that. <laughs> I know that it happens as a shepherd. I know that it happens, but I don't know. I can't explain that to you. How the heck does he do that? I don't know. That's, that's God's thing. I just know that he does it. And I know that he does it for uh, some individuals and not others. And I know that God gives grace to the humble, but as opposed to the arrogant. Those things I know. Now, just to be clear, here's a short list of things Jesus was not trying to convey to us in that passage up here on the board. Oop, did I not do it? Oh, yeah. In Luke 18, 9 to 30, Jesus was not preaching a different gospel than Paul's. Jesus was not saying that simple means void of repentance. Jesus was not preaching anything fundamental beyond salvation proper, even. And Jesus was not preaching works. He wasn't preaching any of that stuff. So if, if you ever hear of anybody looking at that passage and saying any of that, um, run away from them. Or try to help them. If it's not pearls before swine, I guess. Try to help them. 
So no, 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 no. That's not what he was talking about at all. And help them out. And if they don't listen, then run away, I guess. I guess that's more appropriate to say. But he was not preaching a different gospel. That is the big one. These things are things that have been twisted in contemporary Christianity. And they are in contradiction to something very simple that Jesus said amidst the words we just read together up here on the board. Luke 18, 14, I tell you, he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's pretty simple, right? How about this one? How about John 10, 26 to 27? But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And you know what? They follow me. Any questions? Nope. Didn't we just see that with Peter? Yep. They follow me. What did Jesus say to the rich young ruler? Get rid of this little problem you've got, this clinginess to the self-life, and then you can follow me. Oh, it's great that you look all spiritually fit on the outside, but I'd rather take the prostitute or the tax collector that's beating their chest looking for mercy, understanding their unfitness, than you. You're the real swindler. You're the real cheater. You don't want me. You want what I have to give, but you don't want me. In the gospel, my friend, is about me. It's through me. I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one gets to the Father but through me. So don't come to me wanting what I have to give and not wanting me. I wish every Christian, so-called Christian pulpit this morning would say that very thing to their congregation. Because my great fear, and I'm not going to sit, oh, I feel like crying. My great fear is that there's a lot of Christians out there that are unsaved. And nobody's telling them. Nobody's telling them. Because they're too busy worrying about offending them. And they forget about how offensive that person's life is to God. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. The obvious question for doubt is, is how can a spiritually dead person hear the gospel at all? You see, this is where we venture, right? There's this part, man is held accountable and God does it. And then people who are doubters, what do, they, what do they always want to do? They always want to venture into that zone that's God's alone. Well, wait a minute, let's just stop the presses. And they get all satanic, right? Because Satan means attorney. And they start arguing like uh, Satan did in the garden as the serpent. Did he really say? Let's question this. Stop the presses. Let's just question this. So doubters tend to venture in, and they try to drag you with them. Venture into areas that you don't have answers for. And they go, see? You see it? You're stupid. You don't have answers. I do. You don't have answers to my questions, do you? It's a bad question. And if you don't stop them right there and tell them it's a bad question, you get sucked in to a conversation, and next thing you know, you've actually, quote, lost the argument because you're in an area that you have no right being in. So anyways, the obvious question for doubters is, how can a spiritually dead person hear the gospel at all? Oh, yeah, we're born deaf. That's a fact. But you know what? God gives us hearing. As the Bible teaches us, Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But as we've learned, God gives us hearing by grace. If he wants you to hear it, you're going to hear it. If he wants to teach you something, he'll teach it to you. Otherwise, again, he must be impotent then. The good news is that God is patient with the spiritually deaf. Go to Romans 2, 4. That's the good news, I guess, that God is patient with the spiritually deaf. Because until you're ready to hear, He doesn't give you hearing. And do not waste my time by, by asking me when that is, because it's obviously different for everyone. That's why some people are saved at a younger age than other people. I don't know. My guess is that they were more arrogant. That would be my guess. But still, even then, it's God's business. 
Romans 2, 4. Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? Well, thank God for that, that God is patient. Thank God he, he waits around for the spiritually deaf. Thank God for that. Sadly, as many so-called contemporary Christians, quote-unquote, will find out, not everyone repents, and those who refuse to repent will not be saved. Look at verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and relation, a revelation of the righteous judgment of God, and that is the unbeliever's end game. So I was thinking about that and reflecting, as I've argued in the past on this subject, I believe that there are divisions in the churches because of perverted definitions. Perverted definitions. In other words, I believe Satan has done a great job dividing believers even over this topic of repentance. Believers even. On the topic of repentance. How does that happen? I actually think that people have repented, have repented and been saved but then they have believed in a lie about what actually happened at their salvation. And they go around telling people a lie, even though they're saved. I've learned through experience, if two people on opposite sides of the issue actually talk about the salvation plan of God, they will often discover that they actually believe the same things. But their definitions keep them apart. Who does that sound like? Huh? Their definitions keep two people, let's suppose for a moment two people are saved, but they have a different definition on the topic of repentance. Next thing you know, Satan goes like this. Yes. Now I've got something to divide. Eventually one of them is going to say to the other one, you don't understand the gospel. And yet, they were saved the same way. And it included repentance, believing, and faith. But somehow, a perverted definition of something like repentance, or pick, choose your poison, got into the mix, and Satan says, that's all I need. I'll just cause divisions in the churches, even amongst believers. He's very opportunistic. And what I've learned from personal experience is that he likes to mess with definitions. And as soon as he can get you to buy a perverted definition, then now he's got a, a, a fracture. He's got a crack to work with. And he just takes a big old stake and starts going, tink, 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 tink. And next thing you know, you've got believers on one side and believers on the other, and there's factions in the churches. It's really smart. And the funny thing is, he doesn't want you to talk. He doesn't want you to communicate. Because he knows if you communicate and you actually get all the, everything on the table, an honest, humble... I'm not saying everybody's humble or honest or willing. I'll get to that. But if two people are willing and honest and you get everything on the table, what you'll find is, oh my word, we actually believe the same thing? Yeah, we do. But you see, Satan had gotten into our heads. And Satan was encouraging us to, to drive that stake deeper and deeper. Because as Jesus said, a house divided doesn't stand. You want to weaken the churches? Divide them. Even amongst believers. But here's the disclaimer that I just alluded to. Not everybody's humble. Not everybody's willing to come to the table. Do you realize that on a regular basis, I personally get attacked? From people, check this out. From people that don't listen to me. Haven't listened at all except to maybe one half of one lesson. And they say, see what he just said? They take what I say completely out of context, and they use it, and they allow Satan to cause a division. You know why? Because they're flipping idiots, and they're weak, and they're pathetic, and I'll say it to their faces. You know why? Because sometimes I'm weak and pathetic, but I've learned. There's a lot of weak People, even as believers, we don't all of, a, all of a sudden become fundamentally, massively strong once God saves us. <laughs> it's not like all arrogance goes away. And so Satan uses that, even in the churches. 
and you got two people that actually believe the same things but are divided. How does that happen? That's why one of the things you married people out there, and I speak from experience, 99% of the time, if there's a problem between the two people, just talk. The very worst thing you can do is not talk. That is the worst thing you could possibly ever do is go, well, I'm going over there and you're going there. And then, you know, turn the TV on in the bedroom. You could turn it on in the living room. That's a bad idea, by the way, TVs in the bedroom, but that's my opinion. Let's just go our own ways. And then we won't talk for a week. And what does the Bible say? Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Well, what are you doing? You're disobeying God. Who knows best? God does. So maybe you should get over yourselves and stop being pathetically weak and talk. And the next thing you know, like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. We weren't even far apart. You believe the same? Oh, my God. I thought you meant this. What do you mean you thought you meant I thought you meant this. And Satan's like, darn it. They reconciled. Right? The whole time he's like this. Yeah, yeah. And he's, you know, fiery darts. Yeah, you know what he's thinking about you. Oh, you know what she's thinking about you. Right? And he keeps two people divided. Always communicate. Same thing happens between Christ and his bride. If the bride refuses to communicate with the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, you know what happens? The longer you stay away from the word of God, the worse your relationship gets. He's not going to divorce you, but you're going to lose out because you're not communicating. You're not communicating with your true husband. Communication, all I can tell you from experience across the board and from what Holy Scripture says, communication is everything. Starting with communication with the Word of God, through the Word of God with the Lord. Because He is the Word, right? You get the point? In every relationship, communicate. Satan does not want you to communicate. Come to think of it, where was Adam when uh, Satan fooled the woman? Who knows, but he wasn't there. Because maybe if he was right there, she would go, Hey, Adam, what do you think? He'd be like, Stay away! Or maybe, you know I'm getting at, right? Satan's uh, opportunistic, gets people alone, gets people alone, gets them away from their loved ones, away from people that have their best interests in mind. Stop coming to church. Stop fellowshipping this way. That's what I see. Every time I see someone, all of a sudden, you know, they're faithful, and all of a sudden they stop coming. Well, you know, only a little bit. Then they stop coming a little more. Then they stop coming a little more. And the next thing you know, Satan's like, done. Just brings another agent in. It's usually of the opposite sex. You are the sexiest man alive. I know, right? I know. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Everybody else at my church just thought so. See, they're all a bunch of stiffs. You think, I mean, just, we're weak. We're terribly weak. And because we're weak, we give the devil opportunities to divide us, even in the churches. And how does he do it? Back to point. Messed up definitions. Messed up definitions. Here's what the Spirit has to say about definitions. Isaiah 5.20 Woe to those who call good, evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to them. One of the easiest, most insidious ways that Satan trips us up is with perverted definitions. A perfect example is with repentance. If you cling to a hack version of it, your salvation is at stake even. For example, remember the way in which we began this series, attrition versus contrition. True repentance is an act of contrition, not attrition. Contrition is from contrite in Latin, it means to be worn out, ground to pieces, versus attrition, Latin abrasion, scraping, to rub one thing against the other. We looked at all those passages up there. What we learned from that was that true repentance involves the whole man, mind, heart, and will. That's true repentance. It involves the whole man. 
not just some faculty, one little isolated faculty of man. There are many, quote, Christians out there that reject what the Bible has to say about the whole man being involved in repentance. They want to whittle the definition down to mere, let's call it mental gymnastics, leaving gaping holes in the sincerity of the one supposedly repenting. Gaping holes. In other words, they don't actually show up as a whole person. They show up with some desire to receive what Christ has to offer, but not the whole person of Christ. Remember, a personal relationship is two people, right? I mean, you don't have a, you don't have a personal relationship with just one faculty of a person. If you do, that's a perversion anyways. So isn't a relationship between two whole people? Well, that's what Jesus says. I'll come whole, but you have to come whole. Holy Scripture makes this uh, very... Uh, oh, was, go to a, a, a Psalm 3418, excuse me. Psalm 3418. Holy Scripture makes plain statements in contradiction to what I just described, like Psalm 3418. Like Psalm 34, 18. This is Holy Scripture, not Pastor Ed, not Pastor so-and-so, not theologian so-and-so. This is Holy Scripture. And this is wisdom. Psalm 34, 18. This is what wisdom looks like. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Not ones who think they can save themselves. That's what Jesus said. The sick need physician. The ones who realize they're unfit. They're the ones who are open to my salvation. The Lord is near the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Again, up here on the board, just to drive this point home. <coughs> Attrition is void of remorse. Contrition is tantamount to it. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, up here on the board, Luke 13, 5. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In other words, you can't get any further here unless you're going to repent, or willing at least to repent. This is why he taught his beloved apostles to go out and preach the same gospel call to repentance. Go to Mark 6, 7. Mark 6, verse 7. It's goofy because I don't know. I mean, I guess if you're, if you're preaching another gospel, if there was a gospel that Jesus taught and there was a gospel that uh, uh, was in the Old Testament that was taught different, uh, and there was a gospel that Paul taught, um, I guess you'd get kind of tangled up. And it wouldn't be simple anymore. Yeah, no kidding. So Jesus taught the same gospel to his disciples. Mark 6-7. It's not like these disciples all died off as soon as he uh, ascended to heaven. They stuck around. And you know what they did? Read the book of Acts. Mark 6-7. And he summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. That was uh, insulting, in other words. Like, hey, listen, you guys, you don't want to hear what I have to say? Pfft, we're out of here. That just literally just happened to me yesterday. I had to walk away from a situation. I said, oh my, I said, I got to get out of here. I literally walked away. But anyways, verse 12, so what did they do? Guess what? You ready? They went out and preached that men should what? Oh, really? Yeah, really. Well, what does the board say? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So doesn't it make sense that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, would send them out, train them up, so that they would preach that men should repent? 
Yeah, of course it makes sense. It makes total sense. Now, before we close, we have to back up just a little bit in our study, a little bigger picture. Now, it's been a couple of years since we were smack dab in the middle of the gospel reload, but allow me to borrow a few principles from that good work to build a foundation upon up here on the board. On the topic of conversion, conversion implies repentant faith. That is to say that a saved person must be granted both repentance and saving faith from God. And we looked at Acts. Go to Acts 5.31. We'll look at it. Acts 5.31. Acts 11.18 was in there. Ephesians 2.8.9, of course. James 2.14-20. Hopefully we'll get to there. A saved person must be granted both repentance and saving faith from God. I mean, that's what we just saw. We just saw Jesus say it, and then we saw Jesus' disciples go out and preach it. Acts 5.31 He is the one whom God exalted to His right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So who grants repentance? God does. Simply stated, God grants repentance. That's something that a lot of people seem to have wrong in their souls. Again, back to that definition line of thinking. People don't understand it for some reason. They think that repentance is some human work or something. Something not from God. And therefore, since it's human work, based on, say, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it can't be part of the gospel call. Do you see what a def definition does? It, like, it, it, it just has a ripple effect throughout the Bible. Now you've got to actually take something that's false and try to work it in, like massage, or, or fit a square peg into a round hole when you read other passages of Scripture. And the next thing, because you jammed it in there, something else perverted pops out of that thing. So God grants repentance. Again, that's something that some people have wrong in their souls, which is why they say repentance is a work of man. And then they'll suppose that if repentance is a work of man, that it cannot be part of the gospel call. It is how a bad definition ruins a good gospel. Holy Scripture states that God grants repentance. Go to Acts 11.18. Acts 11.18. That's what Holy Scripture says. I have no misgivings about that. I have no misunderstandings about that. Of course God grants repentance. How am I going to repent if I'm spiritually dead? How am I going to do anything? I can't even lift up my arm. I'm literally dead, like right there, you see? That's me. And God says, hey, listen, get up. Repent of being that way. <laughs> but I would, I can't move. <laughs> right? Get up. I'm holding you responsible. What? Are you kidding me? Right? I'm doomed. That's right. Want my help? Can't even do that. Can't do that. I don't know. Want my help? I do. Okay, get up and walk. What? Like the lame man? Get up and walk. Pick up your pallet. Let's go. What? This is unbelievable. Duh. Acts eleven eighteen. When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then... God is granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Holy Scripture also clearly states that God grants saving faith. Go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And you see, now that you get this right in your soul, when you come to this verse that has been just decimated in so many ways, all of a sudden it means something different. You start looking at the whole man, not just some faculty that he has, not some, you know, this, this South Ephesians 2, 8, this is not like some, you know, expedition to get your free ticket to heaven. This is not just some watered down uh, gospel. This is Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which is just explosive. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It, it, we just saw what Jesus said. Unless you repent, you're going to perish. There you sit, dead. Dead as a doornail. How am I going to repent? I can't even move. That's right. By grace. I don't want you to get up on your own accord. 
because then it would be a work. So you get it. You get it. You're held accountable to repent and even have faith. But yet you're dead. There you sit. And then you have Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that says, oh, that's cool because if you were able to get up, it wouldn't be my work. See how simple it is? Again, the point on the board, conversion implies repentant faith. That is to say that a saved person must be granted both repentance and saving faith from God. Let's look at that last passage now. This is the one where the religious people get goofy. You see, go to James 2.14. Where people that are wrong about salvation by works. You see, there are some people that fall on one side. They say, oh, I got a bad definition of something like repentance. And because I know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, there's no way, there's no way that repentance can be part of it because I believe that repentance is a work of man. And so they, they, they err on the side of complete, a watered-down gospel. A gospel that just basically whittles down to this supposed one thing that man can do, which doesn't make any sense, because if he can't do anything, how's he even going to believe? They whittle it down to, oh, you just got to believe. Well, is that a work? Because I don't understand. But anyways, they do that, and it's all watered down. Then you get the other side of the fence that says, oh, it is works. You do have to do something. Oh, yeah, it's Jesus, you know, yay. You know, Jesus is a good guy, and Jesus did, you know, died for my sins. But... It's faith plus works. And that's what James was against. James said, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I've got I to sort this whole thing out. I've got to sort this whole thing out. The only reason you're going to do any good works is because God gives you the faith to do it. What's it we'll read this. James 2.14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food... And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is what? Dead. Being by itself. Dead. The issue is about works up from faith. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? What's the point there? The faith that James wrote about was whole man faith. Was whole man faith. You see, this is what happens. If you have a watered-down gospel, let's say, someone says, oh, you just got to do this one little thing, we'll work on the repentance thing later. But God's not going to change you that whole thing. James says, that's bull. That's garbage. If my father changes a person, if my father saves a person, he saves the whole person. He gives them a new heart. It's not going to be perfect because you're still with the old flesh. But there will be a change. In the, what do you want to call it? The innermost being? The heart? The soul? The spirit? The mind? The will? Take all those things. Throw them into one ball of wax. Call it the new creature. Because that's the thing that's going to heaven. Right? You were born again. That's the creature that goes to heaven. So it cannot be defiled. And it's a whole person. Not part of you doesn't go to heaven. The faith that James wrote about was whole man faith. And his logic stated that a saved man with real faith would do good things as unto the Lord. And though he doesn't explicitly state it, repentance is one of those things that a man with real faith does. Yeah, that's the difference. I mean, that's another whole issue that Jesus Christ spoke of, that even Paul spoke of, that James spoke of. A person with real faith actually does stuff, actually bears fruit. And if they never bear fruit, well, there's probably a problem. I'm not going to say it. I might have my inclinations, and I may talk to someone about it and say, "Mm, just saying, you might want to think about your own faith. Did you believe some garbage gospel? Is that what you've been clinging to? Might be a problem. But I'm not going to say you're saved or not saved. Not my business. But repentance is one of those things that a man with real faith does. He repents. He confesses his sin. Isn't that what David, isn't that what we saw with King David? Yeah. 
Or he was torn up about it. And when he wouldn't repent, what happened? He wasted away, just like some of you. Some of you refuse. Even though I've taught specific issues in your life, literally from this pulpit, whatever you do, don't do this thing. Take up what I just explained about communicating in marriage. That wasn't from me. That was from the Spirit, by the way. And he refused. Nope. I refuse. I'm not talking to him. He's such a dog. You're going to waste away. Your marriage is going to go in the, in the, pot, in the potty. It's going to go in the potty. Right? Your marriage is going to go, go south. Do you understand? Why? Because you're ignoring God, the Holy Spirit, and you won't repent. And by the way, what if you say, oh, well, I'm right? <laughs> Jesus was right always. And what did he do? He always showed grace and mercy. If you're right, be a bigger person than the one who's wrong. doesn't mean accommodate them. It means approach them. Because maybe they're so weak, they just can't get over themselves. Maybe they're so weak that they're ridiculously stubborn. And they hold grudges. Maybe that's their weakness. They're grudge holders. Some of you are married. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but yet there you sit in a position of so-called power, and you have a grudge. And you won't cross the chasm either. Oh. See how I did that? Turn the table around on you? What's that old saying? You point... You point at someone and there's one finger pointing at them and three at you. In case for the visual. In case you couldn't see it. <laughs> but here's what, here's what the Bible tells us. And you can argue all you want, but hey, listen. This is God's business. Repentance is one of those things that a man with real faith does. At salvation we are given a new creature that is repentant and faithful. And neither of these attributes are ever lost. Again, the point on the board, conversion implies repentant faith. That is to say that a saved person must be granted both repentance and saving faith from God. One other way to state this fundamental truth up here on the board, repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You cannot possess the coin unless God gives it to you. Furthermore, when you receive this coin, it is implied you receive both sides of it. Much of this discussion, as many of you will readily recall, was precipitated out of the recognition that today's contemporary Christianity churches are peddling a false gospel. Now that's a tragedy. Because like I said, I'll never be the person to say that every person that's peddling a false gospel is not saved. I actually believe that you can be deceived about certain aspects and water the whole thing down and be confused and and. and and in, in somehow God saved you, and yet somehow you are peddling something that is complete garbage. This false gospel is just a... My bigger fear, though, is that they're not saved. That's my bigger fear, and that's why I've been fighting this battle now for a very long time. And I'm not very popular for doing it. I'm losing friends. Do you understand? I'm not very popular for doing it. I'm just telling you. And people are accusing me of stuff. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But that's how people are. And Satan's working his magic, you see? And he's causing divisions because people are weak and pathetic. It's not me. I'm just doing my thing. Teaching the truth. What I do know is that the false gospel is just attractive enough and it uses all the right language and bait for ins insincere so-called Christians to suppose they have a ticket to heaven in their pockets. But here's what I'll tell you, and I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because it's already quarter past uh, the hour. Here's what I'll tell you. A gospel that accommodates man's flesh is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, let me just put this in perspective and then we'll, we'll have communion, we'll go. A gospel that accommodates man's flesh is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel that says, outside of the divine provision of God to a dead person that's laying on the floor 
get up and walk, you can do it on your own, is a false gospel. Amen? Okay. A, a gospel that says, you don't have to get up and you can still be saved, is a false gospel. Amen? Because you're born again, you're getting up to walk around. Everybody walk around spiritually? As a believer, of course you do. You're up and about, you're walking around. There's a gospel out there that says you can stay dead as a doornail, unrepentant, dead in your sins, and still go to heaven. Does that make sense? You know how accommodating that is? Stay right there. You can stay right there for the rest of your life. Jesus doesn't want all of you. He only wants some weird little thing from you. You can stay dead for the rest of your life and still make it to heaven. When the Bible says you're dead to sin, you're alive to who? Christ. That thing got crucified. I've been made alive. That's a true believer. But there's a gospel out there, believe it or not, being peddled right now from so-called grace churches that says you can stay dead as a doornail right there and get up and walk your way to heaven. Dead. Oh, we'll work out the ambulatory issues later. We'll, we'll work out the forensics later. No, you won't. No, you won't. That's a lie. Do you understand? That's a lie. Because it's very accommodating, because that thing likes it, loves it, was born into it. It's like, this is awesome. And, and it's like the rich young ruler who says, just get, how do I get that thing and stay here? How do I get the best of everything? How do I cling to the flesh and still get to heaven? There's a gospel that accommodates man, that accommodates that very thing, and it's being taught from pulpits right now. That's a false gospel. That's a heinous, false gospel that is probably, in my opinion, based on what I understand of the nature of things nowadays, significantly more popular than what I just taught this morning. Significantly. Why? Because it reaches a broader audience. It says the gate is not narrow. Jesus was a liar. The gate's broad. You can stay dead and still get in. <laughs> Jesus says those are the people who try to get over the side. They say, I don't want to go through the gate. It's too narrow. I'm going to jump over the side. You know the parable? I'm going to get in over the side. I'm going to find a loophole. What am I going to do? What do I need to do to get eternal life? I'm going to come in over the side. Hey, Jesus, look at that. <laughs> right? What does a good shepherd do? What I'm doing. No way. Get off the fence. Right? Get down from the fence. Hurry up. Turn on the electricity. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what a shepherd's meant to do. No, 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 no. No, you don't get to go around. We're not going to play pretend in this church that some of you get to climb in over the sides, you and your, your family member. What, what did Paul say in Acts 16.31? Uh, you should believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved, you and your household. I'm not going to let your household come in either through the side just because you know, you're on the inside and you're like, let's get in, hurry up, honey, let's go reach over, grab them, grab our kids, grab our kids, grab our grandkids, grab them all, let's bring them up over the side. A good shepherd would say, no way. You need to go through the, the narrow gate just like everybody else. And if it's agonizing, Megan, Agizami, remember, you need to strive to enter through that narrow gate. If it's agonizing for you, good. If the gospel's offensive to you, good. That means it's working because your flesh hates it. How, how often do you think that's taught this morning? Nope. Oh, Jesus loves you. Believe in Jesus Christ. Sorry, sorry, Brian. Sorry, Brendan. I mean, Brendan. Brendan's like, whoa, whoa, why the guitar? Okay, Brian. Art, art's like, you know, whatever. Musicians. All right. How often is that? Be no, it's literally, let's play a little music. Let's get everybody emotionally spun up. Like, oh, I cannot believe this thing. This is, is this really happening to me? And running around and 14,000 people got saved in one day. And then a month later, 13,999 are gone. And there's one person like, this actually happened. This is cool. <laughs> That's what you call the narrow gate. 
If it was broad, 14,000 would get in. That's what's being peddled. Is that not a shame? Is that not disgusting? Are you not upset? You should be. You should be. The gospel that accommodates man's flesh is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, let's get the elements ready, gentlemen. Um, let me flip to the last slide here. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of the person of Jesus. Let's eat the bread. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink the cup in remembrance of his work. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for making things simple for giving us the faith of a child, for saving us, despite us, despite ourselves. We know that we were spiritually dead. We know that we were spiritually deaf. We know that we were unable. We know that we were unfit. We know that we were unqualified, and yet somehow in your way you saw beyond it and saved us anyways while we were still helpless. Your Son died for us. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for this time of fellowship with You, for basking in the Gospel of Your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're just so very grateful for Your patience with us, and we pray that it continues for those still lost in this world and that we might be used by you to your glory to evangelize them. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.